convolutional neural networks. So far what we had was we went up to the state of the art around maybe the year 2000. No, sorry, the year 1990, 1992. Um, and so now comes this really amazing time when basically Jan Lecca and his team at AT&T invented convolutional neural networks. And we'll see how far we get with that today. Probably we are not going to get to Lynette today and we might have to cover it on Thursday. Anyway, let's get started. Um, so let's start with something very trivial. So suppose you have a good camera. So like maybe this phone here. This phone here has a 12 megapixel camera. It actually has two cameras inside, but that's a trivial detail there. Uh, so it's 12 megapixels, and if you have red, green, and blue, that's 36 million numbers. Okay, so if I want to build a multi-layer perceptron with 100 hidden layers, right, and sorry, 100 hidden units, just a single hidden layer, well then that's about three and 0.6 billion parameters, which is 36 million times 100, and everything else that comes after that is essentially free, but you know, that's a large number. So if you think about it, probably you want to have at least you know, one or two observations per parameter, so you need about three and a half billion pictures of cats and dogs, but that's a real problem because last time I checked on Wikipedia, there are about 900 million dogs and 600 million cats in the world. Okay. So that doesn't work very well. Nonetheless, if you search on your favorite image search engine for cat and dog and you search over you know, your image data set, it'll do quite well. So they clearly must have done it differently. So this is just to drive this point home. If I have this neural network with one hidden layer, and a single output, then you know that's what you would do. And of course, H is sigma of W to the X plus B. So 3.6 billion parameters, that's around 14 gigabytes if I store it as floating point numbers. So 30 bit, 32 bit. If I have FP16, that's still seven gigabytes. That's still more than your mid-range Turing GPU. Um, on that note, uh, something that apparently snagged a couple of people when they tried designing a network. Um, so remember, let's say we have this as our input. Some people designed that kind of architecture. Okay. So in other words, they reduced it in the first layer from whatever input dimensions to one dimension. Then they got wi went wide again and they went narrow again. Okay. This is a terrible idea. It does not work. Um, so as a matter of fact, uh, I think it was Ryan who then somebody came to him asking, you know, and they had trouble with it. And Ryan fixed the entire problem by just getting rid of this layer. And lo and behold, the network actually worked quite well. So what happened is that this one hidden layer with just a single neuron forced all the features to be projected onto a single dimension. And that's a little bit too aggressive. You probably do not want that. You may have, whoever did this, may have heard of information bottleneck and other things where, as a matter of fact, you can have networks that are of this form, but they never, ever, squeeze out all the information in the first layer because you want to have a meaningful intermediate representation and you almost certainly wouldn't reduce it to one dimension. Um, typically you have networks that just get narrow and then in the end that's it no, and none of this happens. Um, we'll actually see network structures of that kind in when we discuss very steep deep convolutional networks, but the design decisions are pretty much the same regardless. So yes, you want to reduce the dimensionality, but not too aggressively and not by too much. Yes? Uh, 
Yes. So the question is, will we see who, what the amazing architecture was for the winner? Yes. There will be a reference solution and you can look at it. And really hats off to that team because they actually got up to, you know, the, I think the top 10 submissions on Kaggle, which out of 10,000 submissions is stunning. So kudos, really well done. Um, in any case, um, let's look at computer vision. So let's look at a very simple problem, namely, we want to find Waldo. Okay, so what does this have to do with multi-layer perceptrons and computer vision? Well, actually a lot, because if you look at the picture of Waldo here, well, there are a lot of Waldos on that picture, and effectively the Waldo-ness doesn't really depend on where in the picture this guy is, and also it doesn't really depend very much on the neighbors. In other words, those two are perfectly well-defined Waldos. Right. And I don't really need to know a lot of other things in order to identify them. Right. So as a matter of fact, when you teach kids how to play this game, whereas Waldo, you tell them, hey, here's Waldo. Now go find. And then you make yourself a cup of coffee and you wait until they come back and say, hey, I found it. Right. And they're pretty good at using that very simple template of a single image to then scan the entire picture to find this person. And they use the fact that only locally this matters and that, you know, Waldo could be anywhere in the image. Okay. So what does this have to do with math? Okay, so let's actually look at how a dense layer looks like. And what I've done is to make my life a little bit easier, I've indexed my hidden units with HIJ. So rather than just saying I have maybe, you know, 100 dimensional hidden units, I've, I've just arranged them in a grid of 10 by 10 because, you know, I input an image and I can always arrange them in such a way, right? And let's say that these hidden units should at some point indicate the Waldo-ness of that particular part of the image, right? And so in general, I can write this as sum over K and L, WIJ, KL, XKL, right? So XKL, that's the source image. So here's K, here's L. And so you need to scan over the entire image to find where Waldo is. Right. And if Waldo happens to be over here, well, you still need to find him. Right. Okay, that's not Waldo, it's Smiley, but okay, fine. I'm not very good at drawing. Um, so what I'm now going to do is I'm going to re-index the entire expression. So nothing has changed by just indexing it by VIJAB, where AB references the offset relative to IJ. And now I'm summing not over XKL, but XI plus A and J plus B. So this is just some algebraic rearrangement the math is still completely identical. I might have to worry about, you know, boundaries and so on, but all I do is I'll just set the corresponding other terms to zero and everything's good. Okay. Is everybody comfortable with that first line? No. Okay. Questions? What's unclear? Okay. Um, so No, not quite. That's just in the first hidden layer. Oh, just so just this is X, and this is H. And now I'm just indexing it by I and J. Rather, so I'm just representing H, so this hidden unit, hidden, this hidden layer, as a two-dimensional object rather than a one-dimensional object, mm -hmm. which I can always do, you know, just by just reshaping it. And so that first equality is entirely general. I can do that for any multi-layer perceptron as long as, you know, the input dimensions and the output dimensions, you know, can be factorized. I could always write it so. Mightn't make a lot of sense, but I can, you know, write, write it algebraically like this. Okay. 
So is everybody okay with the first hij and the middle part of the equality? Okay. Um, yes, it has to be i plus a, j plus b. Correct. Uh, good catch. Let's fix that. Thank you. Good catch. Um, okay, so every, so everybody's okay with the middle equation. Okay. Now let's look at the last one. Switching from the middle to the last one is really just re-indexing. All I'm doing is I'm just writing k equals i plus a and l equals j plus b. That's all I'm doing. It's just index reordering. And since you know these are arbitrary matrices W, I can just have an arbitrary matrix V. Okay? Now if you look at that, that's actually a convolution, right? Except that right now this thing depends still on a lot of other locations. Okay? So basically the bottom line is really just how I re-index. Okay. Now let's actually apply our math. So remember we have Hij is Vij A B X I plus A J plus B. So all I'm doing is I'm just expressing the Hij's, right? So let's let's say this is coordinate I and J. Right, that's h i j. I'm expressing it relative to what happens around Mr. Smiley Face. Right. Now, what I'm doing is I'm saying, well, actually, what happens around Mr. Smiley Face here and what happens around Mr. Smiley Face over there, well, I should be applying the same filter. So in other words, this vijab, I can drop the index ij. So my weight matrix no longer depends on the location ij, but just on the shift relative to that position. Now if I do this, and I have a 12 megapixel image, in other words, I have 36 million dimensions, I've just reduced the dimensionality of my weight vectors by 36 million. Because I've dropped the indices, you know, referring to the size of the image. So that's a significant reduction of the problem. So already now we could solve the problem if we took pictures of enough cats and dogs. Before that, we had more parameters than cats and dogs, but we've just reduced the number of parameters by 36 million. That's kind of nice. And that is actually an expression that I'm fairly sure you know, because that's just a cross-correlation. Looks like a convolution, right? Okay. Um, any questions so far? So then, here comes the next step, locality. So if you look at Mr. and Mrs. Smiley face, right? So you have this convolutional filter that goes over them. You know, with some weight. And effectively, if you think about it, outside this box here, I don't really care about what exactly happens. So I can just truncate this. So this all goes away. This all goes away. This goes away. And this goes away. So in other words, I just have some filter applied locally, and that's about it. So therefore, I can limit the valid range of the parameters a and b, which determine the offset, to be within some scope. Right? And in practice, people might make this, you know, five pixels to either side. So people pick a very narrow scope in many cases. 
And so now what we get is that Hij is sum over A and B going from minus delta to plus delta, VAB Xi plus A, J plus B. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, so maybe all the math was just a little bit intimidating, but the outcome is, you know, super simple, right? You just, you know, convolve the input with some filter and you get some output. Um, let's go through some numbers because this will make it a lot easier. Okay, so after the mathematical justification, let's look at some stuff in practice. Let's say I have this three by three input and I have a two by two convolutional kernel. What I do is I just, you know, pointwise multiply the entries of that kernel with the input. So let's say zero times zero plus one times one plus two times three plus three times four. Right? And that gives me 19. Then I shift the kernel by one to the right, and I get the same thing again. And I keep on doing this. So therefore, I'll get as my output, in this case, this two by two matrix or image with these entries. Okay. Is everybody kind of cool with that? So after all this scary math, here's what you do operationally. You, you can forget about the scary math unless you want to actually derive convolutions from first principles. Now why would that matter? Well, if you have translation invariants and you get convolutions, then okay, the problem is solved. Somebody's already written that paper. But you might have some other symmetry groups for which you don't know yet what the solution is. And in that case, you can apply symmetry and invariances, and you'll get another kernel. So if you look at that, that's what happens if you take a four by four image, and you take a three by three convolutional kernel, then you get this very pretty animation. Okay, any questions so far? Good. So, therefore, we have a 2D convolutional layer. What it does is it takes as an input, you know, NH times NW, so height times width and input matrix. And you need a kernel matrix. This may or may not be, you know, square. Typically, people use square convolutional kernels, but there are some very rare applications where you might not have that. For instance, the image might have been, you know, recorded with some anamorphic lens or whatever, right? So sometimes people do that when they record for cinema. They basically squish things and then expand it again. And this is mostly what people used to do in the old times when um, basically film and film width was a real issue. But yeah, so you do that. And then, of course, in the end, you add a bias to it. Bias is just a constant. And so you can check that if I have a, an image of some height times some width and a corresponding kernel of some height times some width, then the output is the, the image height minus the kernel height plus one times the same thing for the width. Well, the plus one is simply because if my you know, convolutional kernel and the image are exactly of the same size, I still get the one by one output. And of course, otherwise, I can just shift it around and of course, only as far as I have space either way. So if you're unsure, go home and find a piece of Lego, like one of those nice Lego plates where you build houses on, right? You make the input size of the, you know, image, you know, a like a nice rectangle, you take your kernel, your convolutional kernel as a filter and you move it around. And you see how many positions you get. Okay. 
Now, of course, since this is you know, deep learning, we want to learn things, and in this case, we want to learn WMP. Any questions? Okay, good. So here's some examples. So I can take, let's say, maybe this image here of some rodent-like animal, and then if I use those filters, I get an edge detector, I can sharpen things, I can blur them. Right. So these are hand-engineered filters. So if you use, let's say, Photoshop or Lightroom, you can have like a sharpen or a blur or other filters. Right? That's what those things do. They're basically pre-baked convolutions applied to your image. I mean, by now, of course, people are a little bit smarter than that. So, but essentially, that's what those simple operations do. Okay. This is an example from Rob Fergus's class. So this is some picture, I think, from Boston. And if you have this, you know, convolution and you scan over the image, let's say where the animation works, no, it didn't work then you'll get this output, and if you pick a different other convolutional filter, you'll get something else. So these are actual weights that the deep network learned, and so depending on which filter it applies, you get some other views of what that network sees. Well, it doesn't really see, but it's just the intermediate representation. Okay. So just like one minor nitty detail. Um, so actually we're talking about cross correlations because for convolutions you just flip the indices but that just looks a little bit awkward. And on top of that in terms of memory access and locality it's not so nice. So that's why you don't flip the indices. But there's no difference in practice because you can always express one by the other. Um, quick question because I said in terms of memory access that's not so nice. What do you think would happen? Okay, well, let's draw a picture. Then it becomes very clear. So let's say this is our image. And I've got some filter here. And I'm going over the image like so. And so I'm going forward in memory. Right, I'm going forward in memory, making a jump, forward in memory, making a jump, and so on. Okay. Now, computers are pretty good at caching things that you're likely to read next. And most code, most computer code, goes forward in memory, not backwards. So a lot of optimizations on your computers are hardwired to assume that the next operation is going to be the next element in memory in ascending order rather than descending order. So in other words, if you're there, your computer is probably going to cache this element. Once you're there, it's going to cache this and so on. So it's a really good idea to walk forward. Same thing happens with your uh, kernel here. So if I have a convolution, I would end up walking backwards there. And this would actually slow down things, at least in some cases. If this all fits into cache and you optimize, and there's a lot of other things that you can do, but this is one of the reasons why cross correlations are your friend and convolutions may not necessarily be. Okay. Can you clarify what K is? K, well, K is the convolutional kernel. Oh, here, uh, it should be just uh, the corresponding index and um, that's, that's not what we should see. Um, there should be no K here. It's a typo. Good catch. Hmm. 
So there's another one. So this is what happens if you do LaTeX by cut and paste. Then such things happen. Thank you. Good catch. Okay. Um, of course, besides one dimension, uh, two dimensional convolutions, there are also one dimensional and three dimensional ones. So, for instance, you can use similar principles to the analysis of text. And unfortunately, there, a lot of the analogies are only partially true because text is not entirely translation invariant. Okay. Can somebody tell me why text is not entirely translation invariant? Well, at least it shouldn't be. And for most people, it isn't. Any idea? Uh, n n not, well, the Markovian part isn't really the, the, the source, but it's a, it's a good thought. So what happens, I mean, you have Markovian properties also for images. But the thing is that text has this property that there are sentences, there are paragraphs, so there are boundaries that are not, if I, you know, take a sentence and I shift everything by one word to the right, then I'm dropping the first word of the first of one sentence and adding you know a new word of the next sentence and now you've turned something that probably made sense into gibberish so this is why translation invariance doesn't entirely hold but only for instance between sentences to some extent but also there you know you have paragraphs you have other structure that applies the other thing is that sentence length is highly variable you might have a short sentence like, hello, or you might have a very long sentence about explaining how translation invariance in sentences isn't quite true. Right. So this is why you need a little bit of extra tuning. People have come up with some clever ideas for convolutions for sentences. Turns out that there are simpler techniques like what we'll see later, LSTMs or transformers which will address this as well. But for voice, that's quite true. For time series overall, it's quite true. And for three-dimensional, well, you might have video. So like this thing that's being recorded right now, you have basically width times height times a temporal dimension. Actually, you have a little bit more. You have also red, green, and blue. So you really have four dimensions here, but it's a separate story. So right now, let's just assume that this is three-dimensional or you have satellite images or medical data. And there quite often you measure over an entire spectral, over an entire spectrum of different wavelengths, right? So for instance, a fancy hyperspectral satellite might record 10, it might record 100 different wavelengths. And that will give you a much, much more detailed idea of, for instance, what the atmosphere looks like. Well, for instance, bees have more than three different colors of as photo, of photoreceptors, or if you have mostly men who are colorblind, they might only have two out of three different photoreceptors. So that's then the dimensionality of what you're recording. Okay. Any questions so far? Cool. Good. So then let's actually try this out in practice. Um,